to the session on community development finance. The title is the history and future of, it sounds very lofty. What we want to really do is just kind of demystify and make sure we all understand what the community development finance movement in the United States looks like today. We're going to talk a little bit about the origins of some of these institutions. A lot of them come out of uh, civil rights and immigrant rights and farm worker movements and struggles. We're going to talk about some changes in the landscape today and hopefully give you guys some good information to help you connect, to identify and connect with CDFIs and other community development lenders in your communities. And we're going to offer you some examples of ways that groups partner with CDFIs or how they're able to actually start new community development financial institutions to meet unmet needs in low income and other underserved neighborhoods. Um, so my name is Dayanira Del Rio. I'm the co-director of New Economy Project. We're an economic justice group in New York City. We've worked with CDFIs, community development financial institutions, um, as well as community groups in communities of color in New York City. So I'm going to offer some, some examples of different partnerships that we've launched in New York. Um, I'm also a board chair, the board chair of a community development credit union, which is a kind of CDFI in New York City. It's called the Lower East Side People's Federal Credit Union, and we work with low-income people throughout New York City, but have specific community, uh, communities that we really focus on reinvesting our, our members' deposits in for affordable housing, small business, non-speculative housing. We're trying to support worker cooperatives and others. So that's what I'll be talking about. And then we're joined by, she has to introduce Hi, yourself. I'm Melissa Marcus, uh, and I am the CEO of Genesee Co-op Federal Credit Union in Rochester, New York. We are a low-income community development credit union, and we are a, one, a type, one of the CDFIs. And I'm going to be both, we're co-leading, so we're doing this all together. And so um, that's, I'm going to stop there. Our third presenter. <laughs> I'm Kristen Cox. I'm with Self Help Credit Union, Self Help Federal Credit Union. And so in my bio on Common Bound, you can see I wrote um, the five entities. Self Help is now the largest CDFI in the country. And you can talk, I'm not really going to talk about all the five entities. What I'm really going to talk about is um, my, my role. I work in external relations, member services, investor services with the credit unions. and. Um, those two entities specifically for this workshop. And I think um, that's going to lead us into the first section of our, our, our workshop, which is the, really to talk about the CDFI sector, we kind of need to go back to the beginning and the history. And, um, and ultimately, this is just a snapshot of our, and that's the credit union history. That's the, this is where our movement started, which is really the history of credit unions in the States and started in Canada. Um, and also, this is going to be participatory. We're going to actually ask for your all's experience and knowledge in the room. So don't think you're going to get off too easy. And we are, um, uh, it's going to be great because there isn't 500 of you. And so I don't need to read this. You can see how the credit unions started. Um, and what was you may be unique in 90, I mean, 34, part of the New Deal, FDR signs the, for the, the credit, Federal Credit Union Act, establishes sort of the first official law, and this is also where we get workers' comp, profit sharing, minimum wage, a lot of the labor strikes, labor work that was happening in our country. And what was else was going on, though? I mean, why would we need credit unions, um, which are really co-ops, right, cooperative? We're not-for-profit financial institutions. That's what credit unions are, 501c1s. And, and we're collapsing. And the depression. They were, yes. Why, why would we need, why would communities need separate financial institutions? Keep more money in their communities. Right. But why? What, what was the banking industry serving everyone back in this, you know, early 1900s? They're, bank, they're basically making loans to businesses. They're yep. that much loans being given to individual people. And so what about racially in our country? What was happening? Red line. Right. So in 1918, the first African-American credit union was chartered actually in Rowan County, North Carolina by black farmers. And so I actually live in North Carolina. Self-help is headquartered in Durham, North Carolina. So I'm actually representing this piece because North Carolina has a huge history of credit unions and some of the very first um, minority-owned credit unions um, in this country. So I get to sort of rep that. Um, and I, I would love if someone would, wouldn't mind reading this for us. 
Sure. Uh, the founders were school teachers and principals in segregated schools. They preached on Sundays, taught in local colleges, tended farms, and operated and worked in the business that formed the economic bedrock of AA communities. Uh, but when they had needed loans <coughs> to but a home or to send a child to college, they had no place to turn. They lived in Jim Crow, North Carolina. So the banking banks weren't serving a lot of our black communities. And as we know, African Americans were blocked from financing due to Jim Crow laws. So folks set up their own credit unions. These were very small, often informal, church-based credit unions, farm worker credit unions, um, sharecroppers, teachers. Um, this is the history that was, I mean, we, and actually there were a bunch and there was a proliferation of um, credit unions and in these communities and actually a woman, uh, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhard wrote in Collective Courage a book about the history of African American cooperatives. So I really want to lift up as we talk about a lot of the, the new initiatives in banking but that this is actually the history that our movement we're going to talk about is born from. Read the book. It's great. Yeah. Awesome. If you're in New York City next week there's a big dinner to honor her on the 14th. Great. Yeah, I'm just great. I'm getting chills. <laughs> so in 1948, North Carolina had almost as many rural African American credit unions as all states combined. All states across the country. Um, one example was a sharecropper savings club. Okay, so we're not gonna like, we're not gonna um, spend too much time on this, but this is sort of I just really wanted to share um, this history. And so before, let's take a pause. Let's just talk about the distinction between the institutions, if we can. This is not a perfect image. Um, but before we get in now to the what happened through the night the through the 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 current 20th century um, or the 1950s and 70s and such is um, banks this is what I how I'm interpreting this is banks how do they make money mostly fees yeah Fees. So when I say money, it's, the banks are making money off fees mostly, and they're lending mostly. When we say to middle class folks who have money, not necessarily folks we don't do. They don't necessarily do consumer loans. Most banks don't. Big banks don't. If you can't read in the back, so the little people, right? So this this squiggly guy in light blue is a low or moderate income. Is how we're describing. So like a lower income person, the guy with the hat is middle class, and the guy with the briefcase is, is someone with a lot of money. <laughs> is a resource, okay? So here the banks are taking money from all of these people. Sort of questionable whether they're even trying to, yeah, but they're taking money from communities and they're, it's going to um, the wealthier people. That's where they put their loans, right? And what is, so uh, there is one type of fee in line item that banks do a lot that is contentious. And, it, and overdraft, right. okay? And so how much annually do you think banks make from overdraft per year? Number, throw up. Um, Two billion. 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 Higher. 20 billion. Lower. <laughs> it's about 14 billion. That is def by far the largest um, fee structure that banks do and a lot of, uh, we do a lot of work to combat that and credit unions are here to do, um, do small dollar and alternative loans. But this is a truth about a lot of big banks. So if you move into credit unions, the reason they're cooperatives, as we've stated, the distinction is that there are corporate credit unions. Everyone has a charter. So when you have a charter, you have to serve a membership. And so credit unions, by default, are serving their members, right? But some credit unions you can't get into. You have to work for an institution or you have to work for um, a, you know, some employer you or a municipality. So it's not, for, it's not everybody can become a member of a credit union. Am I right? What else about credit unions? They can mimic banks. All right. They can they can pay their trust. Their, they can pay their board, or they can you know. So so there's a, there's sort of a there's what we're saying is not all credit unions are created equal. Did yeah, you say? Although, just one clarification. So all credit unions, so we're going to talk about some of the contradictions, right? We're not here to say all credit unions are wonderful and all banks are evil. And there's like a range within all of this. And we want to, in the end of this session, we're going to have a breakout session with discussion about what are challenges and limitations um, and real contradictions as well with some of these institutions. But one thing just to us, all credit unions share certain things in common. They're all nonprofit. Yep. They're all cooperatives, meaning when you put money into a credit union, you become a member slash owner of that institution. You are the shareholder, right? And then the, the, direct, the board of directors of that credit union, which sets policies and 
and mm -hmm. you know direction and de makes decisions for the credit union, that's all made up of members of the credit union that are elected by other members. Mm -hmm. So that's the cooperative structure. You're an owner mm -hmm. and you elect your leadership. Um, mm -hmm. So actually you can't pay your, all of the board of directors yeah. or volunteer unpaid. There no, so there's no money that the credit union is generating in profits and paying out to private shareholders or investors. They either pay out to their full membership um, dividends or they reinvest the, mm -hmm. you know, any extra income that they make back into their institution to lower prices, improve their services, and so on. And so the distinction is how people choose to pay their employees. Some people could pay astronomical, you know, similar, similar to banks, or they could keep things sort of in a, the distribution of you know, wage ratio that's more ethical and responsible, essentially. Mm -hmm. Then you move over to community development credit unions, and this is by far we had not a perfect. I mean, we're trying to figure out what the image is, but essentially how I'm going to say this is that what happens is people that live, work, worship in an area can become members of a credit union, and then the money is lent for community purpose and to those individuals who are members of that credit union. But community purpose could mean a lot of different things, and so we're going to talk about some of those. But you can see here that's a community. Housing, nonprofits, child cares, um, healthy foods, food justice work, co-ops, okay? Credit union, the credit union that's restricted to its membership isn't necessarily going to have as wide a, 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 a service area to lend to, okay? So that's a real distinction in the evolution of the movement. And we're going to talk about when that happened because it's not that long ago, which is why our movement is relatively new and a lot of people don't know, right? And so though this is a leverage, this is a leverage, a leverage symbol to say, hey, actually we can raise money and secondary capital to support, and we talk about innovation, our product, when you want to serve um, folks who need to build credit, you need to have some way to make, to do those types of programs. So this is sort of what the, the leverage ability means, is we're all pooling money, raising some money, and also then lending to a larger network and a larger community pool. Okay, so any distinctions, questions, starting to understand sort of the, how communal credit unions might, might, might um, be defined differently as credit unions? Can we, yeah. we also have just, can I, a show of hands, like how many belong to a credit union? Mm -hmm. So, okay, great. Okay. So you're in, you get it. Okay, and how many of you that belong to credit unions belong to a community development credit union? I mean, you're not sure. Yeah, right. That would exactly. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of it is actually like we can talk about community banks. You know, black-owned banks that exist. Right. It's all about for me, and you all can add like, who are they lending to? Are they lending the money? What's their loan-to-share ratio? Who are they lending to? That's the questions you could ask to see how responsible your financial institution is to where you are. You say. Okay, so let's move on. So we had a steady growth of credit unions. Okay, the law was passed, proliferation, 40 to 70s, 20,000 credit unions, yay, right? At its peak. And then what happens? Dun, da, da, da. Okay, so, so yeah, so we're gonna just popcorn what was going on in the 70s and 80s that made it that in this country. And Dade, would you assist in the... Uh, Right over there. Do you mind just shifting over for a second into this seat? So we have deregulation. Who wants to explain what that meant? Well, as someone who's in their 60s, I'm surprised that a lot of people don't know that when I was a young woman up until the mid-1980s, and I forget the exact year, all banks in America, first of all, they were either um, depository institutions or investment banks. They were not mm -hmm. the same thing. And all depository banks operated within a single state. No bank was allowed to operate in more than one state. It was the Bank of California. There were banks that operated in Ohio. There was Mellon Bank in, in, in Pennsylvania. And therefore, the banks had to be pretty small. They had to lend back. They had to you know, accept deposits and then lend back into their own states. And they deregulated that. And then there was this wave of bank mergers. And we ended up with the 12 big banks that dominated the whole industry. Thank you. Others, what was going on? Credit, when the credit, credit cards, rise of credit, okay? That changed a lot what people could rely on, how people could get money. Other things? Inflation. Inflation, okay. Globalization. Mm hmm. So, isn't that in that area when they 
started um, kind of bundling mortgages and kind of selling them off as larger investment assets. Yeah, Melissa's going to talk about the decoupling of the Glass-Steagall Act that was happening, starting to happen at this time. So a lot was going on, and Melissa, do you want to share anything in particular about this, um, the magnitude? Uh, well, I, I mean, I think that I mean, we're going to move on a little further into history, but that is exactly, you know, it's kind of like with the rise in the access to credit, with the rise in, in use of credit to determine who gets loans, who doesn't get loans, and we're having uh, mortgage lending start to happen, right? You know, everybody wants to own their own home. Uh, you know, that's, that's exactly the kind of thing that is beginning to happen, you know, what we treat as normal, but then at a whole other level, Wall Street begins to get involved in securitizing these loans. And, you know, we're having this, I think the other big part of this is real estate and the price of real estate and the rise of the housing market is also something that we're going to, that we start to see. But some of these pieces, mm -hmm. you know, it starts to be built on what's happening. And just to be clear, this is also another way to look at that is like, this is when the explosion of consumer credit starts to happen. When everyone starts to get offered credit cards and loans and there's this huge, it's also when there's like sort of parallel shifts with disinvestment in schools and other things and there's like this shift towards encouraging people to pay for things on credit and debt becomes the way that people are, are expected to make ends meet. Yeah, and two of things that's happening right now. Um, what you were you were saying um, uh, around banks, banks. The, the, because there was a lot of um, conflation and and um, merging happening, you see banks pull out of low and moderate income communities, and ATMs are on the rise. So this not seeing bricks and mortar as being a valuable investment in communities. This is happening, as well as tighter regulation and economic pressure. So what happens to those informal credit unions when you have tighter regulation? from uh, and wanting things to be merged and consolidated they have to get with the program they have to hire professionalization they have to abide by if you're a, a 10 million dollar credit union or a 1 million dollar credit union it doesn't matter you have to you have to abide by the same laws and so that put a ton of pressure on these small credit unions and that is what we'll we'll see happens and i just want to give a little a story that happens in the midst of this so my mom was a loan officer in a community in San Diego called Barrio Logan. Almost all Mexican uh, community, you know, all, predominantly. And she was there because she could speak Spanish. She would come home, this is 1974. And I remember this very clearly because she would come home and she would cry. And the only other time I'd see my mom cry is when there was a death in the family. So I was thinking, oh, who died? I was 14. And she told me, uh, Mom, and I was like, Mom, what's wrong? What's wrong? I, she said, I'm so sick of my work. She worked for Bank of America. She was a loan officer. They will not give loans to the people who live in this community. They come in, they put their deposits in, they're faithful, uh, you know, uh, customers here. They won't give them a mortgage. They would give them a loan, maybe. They might give them a credit card, maybe. They would, even if they had repaid, they would not give them a mortgage to live in their own community. You know, and so that really affected me. That's why I'm running a credit union, right? Because in that moment, I was like, you know, why won't they lend? Why won't they give mortgages? You know, it just it blew my mind. This is, to me, I didn't even know in the midst of it, you know, later I'm like thinking when I first learned about the Community Reinvestment Act, which was passed by Congress in 1977, I was like, oh my God. Well, I was living through that, you know, <laughs> through my mother who, you know, couldn't, we couldn't, no one, they couldn't get mortgages. You know, and that, I mean, I think everybody, raise your hand if you know what redlining is, right? We're not having to explain a concept like that, right? Great. So that's a part of, you know, our, the history of what's happening. Do you guys want to add anything there? No. Um, well, why, I, did, why did it come about? What is the CRA? Well, the CRA, do people know what this Community Reinvestment Act is? What, what it's doing? We have some folks in the Oscar. Oscar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it did a couple of things. Uh, I guess the first thing is it outlined redlining, technically. Yeah, technically. 
Uh, the second thing it did is create a framework in which banks were, were, were in which communities could force banks to come to the table on certain occasions, such as when this, the banks get a CRA rating, so they get examined every two to five years, depending on the size and the past performance of the bank. So whenever the bank has gets an gets gets uh, an exam, there's a period when the community can be there and say, uh, but you should rate this bank poorly uh, because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, that structure exists and it's, it has a lot of problems, but it, it does do one thing, it does bring banks to the table. You can also bring two banks to the table when there's a merger. Anytime there's a merger, three, there's about 300 bank mergers a year. Uh, look out in the headlines in the newspapers, it's, usually, it's not really in the headlines, it's like on page six or six, <laughs> look for the mergers because there's a 30 to 60 day period in which the community can, can go to the re local regulators, the local regulator, not the federal one, it's, a, it's the local office of the federal regulator, and say, hey, this merger is happening, we want some community benefits out of this merger. Um, that's a structure that was created out of the CRA. And so different communities around the country have been able to extra uh, extract various or, or restore various benefits out of it bank mergers and banking out of this structure, but there's lots of problems with it, but that's, yeah. that's the CRA. Does and anyone have I'm a story of how uh, CRA was used in your communities, in your organizations? Or did you want to add something else, Melissa? Well, one of the things I wanted to say is, I also, we didn't put it up here, but prior to that, two years earlier, is the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, oh. okay? And, and, and in 1975. That was really important because that actually requires the financial institutions regulatorily to disclose where their loans are, um, their mortgages are and their loans, where, in what neighborhoods. And to have that data then makes the Community Reinvestment Act more powerful because you can have the data to uh, challenge a merger, to say you're not lending here in the neighborhoods that we're trying to get investment in. So that's, the two are really linked. There's a third one, I should, I should mention, because you bring it up. The third one is the, FD, the FDIC collects, and, and it's easy, it's super easy to find actually. You can find it by zip code. The FDIC, banks have to, because they, have, they get the deposit insurance, they have to report how many deposits are located in each bank branch that they have. So you, it's super easy to go in by zip code and just see, even if you're a zip code where the median income is $50,000 and there's two bank branches serving 50,000 people in that, in that zip code, uh, that's the numbers in like New York City at least, then you can see there's still $80 million in deposits in that zip code. Just a clarifying question because I, I always thought that the CRA basically said that if banks are just accepting deposits, in mm -hmm. a low-income community, they have to make a commensurate amount right. of loans back into that community. But that, and you know, well, apart from all the technical details about how that data is collected and how it's enforced and how you can appeal it, but it, I think it was a really good piece of policy yeah. that um, pushed the banks to reinvest where they were accepting deposits and in low-income communities where they hadn't been lending. Is that a relatively true? That, that yeah, so that's right? the theory. Is that they they would they're okay. because so they're publicly chartered, they have an obligation to do put, yeah. do more and put money back so, in. So what the CRA says is that banks in their service areas, right, which are defined differently, they must serve all communities equitably, including low and moderate income neighborhoods. So what that means is, um, where are people from here? Anyone from New York City? I knew that, so that's why I asked that. Okay, that's what I know. Um, so if you're in New York City and you're a bank serving citywide and taking deposits, you can't say, no, 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 our service area is only the Upper East Side, which is very wealthy, or the Upper West Side, and it's not the South Bronx, or it's not East New York, or Bedford-Stuyvesant, or Brownsville, right? They're not allowed to do that tech by, under CRA. Um, and then, you know, as Oscar was saying, it's, uh, you know, what it's really been is a tool for organizing. So it's something, you know, does anyone know what percentage of banks pass their CRA ratings? 98% or whatever. 98%? That's pretty... That means 90... Oh. What is it? It's no, no, keep going. Yeah. It's lenient then. <laughs> yeah. So 98% of our banks are passing their CRA right. exams. That means our banks are doing great, right? No. 
Right, yeah. exactly. So, so it's what it's been enough. is, you know, as they said, it's a tool for groups that are organizing to bring banks to the table during mergers, if they're going to close a bank branch or open new bank branches. These have all been opportunities for groups to bring banks to the table and win concessions. I'll give you an example of the credit union that I'm on the board of, which is Lower East Side, 1980s. Um, you know, it was a very low income, underserved, you know, neighborhood, very different from how it looks today, if anyone's familiar with it. And um, there was one bank branch serving a hundred block radius, um, hundreds of thousands of people. So that one bank branch was going to close. And what community residents and activists did was they came together and organized a CRA challenge. Um, and they met with the bank and the regulators. And what they were able to do was get the bank to basically give its branch to the community to start its own community development credit union. And that's the origins of how we started. There's other credit unions that come out of stories like that as well. Banks today through CRA put money into, put money into CDFIs um, and lots of other examples. They do home ownership programs, reduced rates. So there's, you know, there's definitely been, you know, there are studies that show how much money was put into communities that wouldn't otherwise be there were it not for the CRA. That said, it's you know, outdated, the banking system looks different today, and so there's a lot of groups that are working to figure out how do we bring this, you know, how do we update it and turn it into something that is really addressing the problems of today's banking and lending system. But it's an important you know, context to know about, for sure. If people want to stay after and talk more about specifics, we can talk more about this, how the CRA interacts with banks and credit unions, but we're going to keep moving, but there, I have more examples to share as well. Yeah, and I would just say I, I was the, a, a founding co-chair of a CRA coalition in Rochester, New York. This was back in 1989. And we were using the data. We were mm -hmm. uh, getting, you know, working to oppose mergers. In the end, they could make promises. You know, this would be my analysis. They could make lots of promises and, and put it in agreement. But then what they actually did, it was much harder. Once the merger had happened, they'd gotten, you know, their agreement. I mean, they, they had gotten their merger. They got their part. To get them to then say, what we did, we did this, we did that, they basically ignored you. That's that, they ignored the coalition. You couldn't get them to really produce the results that they had promised. Which is why, you know, in my mind, I moved into, let's run our own financial institution. You know, it's good and important. It's important to have because they do have that obligation, but it, all, it has its limits, you know, especially as banks just grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so we're jumping forward into the, <laughs> to 1994, and I'm going to really make this super short. That is when... Um, under the Clinton administration, the CDFI Act passed, which is Community Development Financial Institutions. It was it really uh, established the CDFI fund, and that CDFI fund is under the Department of the Treasury, and it is a mechanism to provide um, money and support into uh, for community development financial institutions and to kind of recognize that there are these community development loan funds, community development banks, community development credit unions, uh, other community development entities that are, are doing housing and business development uh, and, and kind of uh, created that umbrella. Okay, I'm just going to move on from that. You want to, I mean, I'm just watching time, so. Yeah. Um, I think that just to realize we, that there's lobbyists that have to preserve that amount of money. It's an appropriation of about 230 million, 200 to 20 to 230 million per year. And you have to remember this is serious, like grant fund, like serious money that credit unions and other institutions wouldn't be able to, to have otherwise um, to work with um, if this fund didn't wasn't hadn't been established. That's yeah, very true. Oh, and that was really for the CR the CRA question. Um, and, but I also want to just, you know, say in, under the Clinton administration in 1999, that's when <laughs> Glass-Steagall was, uh, the act of 1933 was repealed. And so people, and show of hands, who knows Glass-Steagall, what that means? Okay, good. So we don't really have to go into that, you know, it's just the separation. Uh, of commercial banking, investment banking, insurance. Basically, Citibank stood up publicly and said, uh, we're buying travelers before the repeal. We're going to do something that's illegal in our country. And then Clinton, we passed it so that they, what they were doing wasn't going to be illegal. But they made it sound a little nicer. They called it, what was it, the Financial, Modern, Financial Services Modernization Act? Oh. And it, it essentially gutted those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. There's no yeah, we need to be modern. Right? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. The CDFI fund, where does that money come from? That goes into the fund? 
comes from the treasury. Think, yeah. Right. Yeah. Because I, just, I just want to point out too, the CDFI fund it gives out grants, but you can turn a credit union, premium dollar credit mm -hmm. union, and other CDFIs can turn the grants into part of the grant into a loan fund. So it's seeding capital. Yep. It's not. It's not just you know. Once it's out mm -hmm. there, it, it's it's it's, it's a, a leveraging a mechanism. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and we're, we won't get into it, but it, it does leverage many times over. Mm -hmm. You know, with a credit union, yeah, it's that every dollar that comes in in our credit union, right. we leverage out about at least 10 times over. Yeah. So yeah. It's, um, it's a mechanism, instead of just dollar for dollar investing in these communities, you put it into an institution that can leverage it many times over. So, you know, we basically, we are jumping from 2000 to 2008. You know, it was trying to preserve, preserve the CDFI fund through what wasn't the Clinton administration, through the Bush administration, let's just preserve it. Um, at the same time, we're having what we were talking about earlier and what people are, you, you know, you know, what happened to our economy. I mean, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm leaping to make yes. a big assumption, <laughs> assumption. People know and understand some of what happened, but what we did have was this financial meltdown. Um, it did give rise to the Dodd-Frank re financial reform and most importantly, in my mind, super important that goes hand in hand with the CDFI yeah. fund, in my mind, is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, yeah. which is CFPB, but it's a way to preserve and help consumers to be protected. And, and CDFIs, we need that to go hand in hand. And while many financial institutions will say, this is over regulation, we can't stand it, even our own Credit Union National Association kind of pick, can pick apart the, and sees the CFPB as a problem or as, you know, at the, at, at the same time, it's super important. For CDCUs, we're like, yay, we're glad that it exists. Um, and then uh, I just w we w wanted to just say, can you just do the other bullets, that from the inception of the CDFI fund, really under the Obama administration, CDFI fund has been um, uh, supported and it's been, you know, kind of come back to life. There's been more uh, uh, support for it and uh, it's made a big impact for all kinds of CDFIs. Through the inception, uh, there's been 1.7 billion in, a, in awards in those grants, but really the key is it's leveraging so much more money for uh, communities uh, in, to do uh, first time home buyers, uh, microenterprise lending, you know, a whole you know, series of supports for significant lending in low and moderate income communities and people in, in, in uh, communities, minority communities as well, and I rural often, communities. I often like to think of community development credit unions as being the microfinance industry in America that people just don't know about. Doing serious, small dollar loans in communities that you may not even know about. And I, I, just, I think about, we think about microfinance and new ways to do lending. I mean, these are actually institutions that, have, that are doing it, so. Yeah, really important. And then, I, can we just, okay. And then, but we want to recognize that through this history, you know, we had these 20,000 credit unions. As of, you know, the beginning of 2016, there is 6,150 credit unions in the country and going down so about by one a day. I don't know if that's slowing, but it's pretty close to what's happening. Some of which are mergers, most of which are mergers, but, and then some of which are being liquidated. But the, uh, while credit union membership and assets have been growing, which is an important because they're financial cooperatives, at the very same time that that's been happening, the smaller credit unions, there's a lot of pressure for uh, the smaller credit unions to actually survive and thrive into the 21st century. So I'm gonna stop there, in the US. For, for community development, credit unions like ours, the question is with all this consolidation now in the credit union industry or movement, <laughs> depending on what you want to call it, how do we make sure that you know, we don't have what happened with banking consolidation where whole communities get cut out of the equation basically. So we'll talk about some of those um, strategies in the next discussion. And just because Melissa has this on the slide, and we're not going to talk to new market tax credits if you're interested. Um, some CDFIs are new, ma new market tax credit eligible lenders. And essentially what that does is it takes um, your, your community membership. So if I have a branch in a certain area, I can only lend in that, area, that footprint. 
If, I'm in, if there's a new market tax credit eligible census district in any other place in the country, I can actually lend. My institution can lend potentially to that project. And that's, but this is also how banks enable more of their CRA eligible and other lending is if they, they will lend to the CDFI to do new market tax credit eligible and they get, they get benefits, it's a tax credit to a lot of banks. So just to, to think about how you know, certain innovations that do benefit banks, but allow for more lending beyond the footprint that my small credit union or my institution. So we can talk about those later. We don't, they're really complicated, but it is, uh, it is a point. $33 billion is a dang lot of money, amount of money. So, yes, Oscar, are you gonna get in? Just, just a couple more numbers, if I could. Okay. <laughs> so 6,150 6, credit unions in the US. Um, there are 1,012 federally certified CDFIs, which just means they're eligible to get money mm -hmm. out of the CDFI fund. There's 1,012. There's $108 billion in assets under management of those CDFIs. 53% uh, of those CDFIs are loan funds. 27% are credit unions. And, but 53% but of the assets under management are in credit unions. Thank you. I, I actually had wanted to almost include a slide like that, but part we're trying to get to small group discussion. So that's great. Can I ask Oscar a question? Do you know how many credit unions are in the United States? Do you know? 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 Do taking their CRA obligations and reinvesting in CDFIs to make those loans with them. In other words, to what majority, extent is the CDFI sector the vast really, majority of the vast majority of the money is re-granted from large banks? Not re-granted, well, no. they're invested from banks and when, in order to meet their CRA requirements. But just to clarify, when banks are putting money into credit unions, for example, mm -hmm. they're, what they're mostly doing are non-member, they're putting deposits in credit unions and they're making money. They're just making below market rate returns on it. So even when they're saying that these are CRA investments, what they're doing is basically plunking $100,000, $200,000, $50,000. They're shrinking also as banks consolidate. Now you have fewer banks making these investments, right? So what it is is they're providing liquidity to the credit union so that the credit union can use that money to make loans, but they're not granting money for sure. And that actually was really created under the Bush administration, the whole Bank Enterprise Act stuff, the BEA money. So I don't even want to talk they about that. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Deposits go to the credit union depository institutions. But and, not yeah, union. we're gonna break up, y'all. We're gonna have a lot of. We want to get you all talking, but we really want to move through our example, our powerful examples yeah. now. Right? Are we moving right. on? Yeah. So yeah. we get to talk about the real work now. What's happening in the, that CDFIs are doing? Okay, so fighting predatory lending. So um, in the last slide we saw CFPB, this new, the first ever federal agency charged with defending people in the financial services system. It didn't exist before. Um, and this was the Elizabeth Warren's brainchild. So that, that institution um, is charged with, you know, passing new regulations and rules and enforcing those as well with many of the institutions against predatory mortgage lending. Um, what else? Debt collection. Anything else people want to talk about? Anything going on right now? Right now, they're actually in the midst of developing a rule to address payday lending. These 400% short-term interest rate loans that have been compared to sharecropping that are called debt traps, um, that are basically made with, the business model is that people can repay them at the end of two weeks or a month, and they have to roll them over and give the lenders a chance to keep paying more fees. Um, so this is an industry that, you know, if you looked up predatory lending in, you know, in a perfect world in dictionary, like that is what this, that's how you define it. So the CFPB does things like that. Now, um, so what credit unions and CDFIs can and should be doing more of, and we've been very successful in New York in getting them to do this, is joining coalitions that fight for strong laws, strong enforcement against banks, against debt collection companies, against payday lending. And in New York State, we're one of the 14 states that do not have, this does not have payday lending. We call it Payday Freelandia. It's 14 states and the District of Columbia. We have these cute posters, vintage posters, like, welcome. Well, that's not my poster, but yeah. But those are, um, <laughs> um, these are the states that are lit up, right? Is that right? 
that are yeah okay that are um, do not have payday lending. Now, how do, how are we able to do this against aggressive, powerful lobbies that every couple of years come into the New York State Legislature, for example, um, through check cashers that are you know that's in in New York it's a check cashers that have been trying to get into the door with this stuff. And we've been able to defend our state laws that ban payday lending because it's a felony. It's actually criminal usury in New York State to charge more than 25% interest. And so we've been able to defend that and get our state financial regulators to enforce that and to go after online payday lenders that are trying to get around our laws, that have been trying to you know, do all kinds of, you know, they're very creative in trying to get around state laws like ours. We've been able to do that because we built a strong alliance of civil rights groups, labor groups, community, fair lending, and CDFIs that can say, we are responsible lenders, we're all over New York State, we're in low-income neighborhoods, that's our bread and butter, and we do make small dollar loans, but we actually, <gasps> gasp, you know, we actually look to see, can someone repay us? <laughs> is what they really need more debt? Or is this gonna actually hurt them in the long run? And that's been a huge boon to lots of advocacy fights, all, lots of um, policy fights in New York State against predatory, payday, predatory mortgage lending, payday lending, and lots of other examples. So. And, and this is also a great opportunity if you're like angry, this is egregious, this should not be happening. I don't know if you can see. These are 300, 500 percent, you know, you know, up on this screen. It's awful. And so one of Self Help's five entities is actually our nonprofit and research policy institute that works with Day's organization and other credit unions around the country to do coalition building to, to fight abusive um, lending. And together with our work across the country, right now there's a stop the debt trap national rule that we're asking the CFPB that Melissa just outlined that, that was, we, we want to insist that there be stricter laws on doing payday lending in this country. So this is actually a website that you could submit a comment. We need folks to submit comments from the ground to say, hey, this is not okay for our communities and for the people that, that, that need you know, ethical loans to, for small dollar needs. And when I worked at a small credit union in Chicago, the most common need to get a $500 loan was to pay a bill. Seriously. So this is important work. So we'd love to, you all can connect to see what work is happening in the states where you are. Um, and thanks, Dave, for your leadership in um, fighting predatory lending. The, and I can't emphasize enough as a... If running a, an every day, you know, running a community development credit union, a low, moderate income uh, community, uh, predominantly to people of color, it, if we didn't have the advocates working for and trying to get rid of the predatory lending that happens, it just, all it does is we have our own members or new members who are coming in and they have negative equity. I mean, they are coming in completely upside down on car loans on having any, if they've accessed through the internet, uh, predatory loans, it's just, it's very destructive. And we're trying to be on the positive end of creating the ownership and the assets. So we need both hand in hand, the collaboration's really important. I'm just gonna, I was gonna touch on worker co-ops and the co-op network in New York State, that's another collaboration that because credit unions our financial cooperatives, it's really important in our work to collaborate with and, and support other worker co-ops. And we have a very, we're trying to start and, and uh, formalize an initiative that we've had going on for a few years for worker co-ops, housing co-ops, uh, 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 um, credit unions, all kinds of co-ops happening in New York. And I think you can also try and look and find out is that happening in your own state, in your own community. It's and gonna stop there. Note, there's something there that says in the low income and non-speculative housing. Um, so my credit union in New York City uh, is one of the few lenders that actually makes loans to what are called HDFCs in New York. What they are are limited equity housing cooperatives for low income people. And it's a form of homeowner, it's like one of the last forms of truly affordable home ownership for low income people in New York City. There are you know, thousands of buildings around the city that are in this program. Um, and what it does is we make loans to people to purchase their homes for as little as sometimes a few thousand dollars, apartment built, apartments. 
in multifamily buildings. And they're cooperatively owned and controlled, but they're limited in terms of um, resale. You can't flip it and make lots of money on it. It's, a, it's really about preserving long-term, deeply affordable housing. So we're one of the few lenders that, that makes loans like that. We're also involved with community land trust work. So anyone who's engaged in this kind of housing, affordable housing work, CLTs, you know, there might be ways to connect with your um, local CDFIs to support that. And so I'm going to things here for in the worker co-op land. Um, anyone heard of Opportunity Threads? Yes. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Opportunity Threads uh, is sort of Molly Hempstreet, great. It's a 20 per worker owned co-op in Morganton, North Carolina. They're so and die company. So they're in Morganton, North Carolina. That's where I'm from. Woo, that's how we know each other, Liz, maybe. Okay, okay I don't know. <laughs> we, Self-Help Credit Union, has a branch in Morganton, North Carolina. So wouldn't that be a natural alignment to serve and possibly work with and lend to their employees and for their mortgage, whatever they need, right? Financial services. So we've developed a partnership to work with Opportunity Threads. Hopefully they're looking to build into a new building so we can assist with that. But right now it's um, 529 um, savings accounts for their, for their employees, other products and services and mortgages that they need. So that's just another, it's like, hey, is there a communal credit union in your community? Can you be partnering in some way? Trans Justice Funding Project. Anyone heard of the Trans Justice Funding Project? Fabulous. You, you are aware? Yes? I okay. Giving Circle. People know what a giving circle is? Pooling money comes from La Tanda, actually what we have adopted from Latin American culture of pooling resources and to share. It's a different form of grant making. They actually have an account with self-help. So they, for people that need to have a tax write-off to give money, you can go through a foundation. But what if you don't? What if you want to lend to individuals and co-ops and educators and, and to lend to trans projects? Well, you don't need a foundation to do that. You could pool your money. We have a money market. We have a money market. Credit unions offer money markets, just like banks. You could pool that, use that money for some sort of you know, housing, co-housing you know, reserve fund instead of a bank. And so then we, they pool their fund and then they make grants from that account at self-help. So just, you know, this is about creative, getting creative with, you know, it doesn't always have to be about lending money. It can be about partnership in the way that we work together for, for our resource work. Let's see. I just, there was a, a, something I've heard come up in New York City and I just don't want to distract from the rest of it, but that there's an issue around certain lending, that phrase that I've heard is the non-natural person's problem of, of, of business lending and people lending. And just to talk maybe for like 10 seconds about the, like there are some blocks to lending to worker co-ops. I don't want to get into the problems before you talk about this thing. I would call them perceived blocks. Okay. Yes. All right, that's great to know. Can okay. we maybe make that one of the small group discussions? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. folks that we'll want to do that. that, how about, does that work? Like, talk about that? Work okay. Because um, we want to get you all in, five, in seven <laughs> minutes to have 15 minutes of, of yeah. discussion time. Yeah. Yes, Oscar? Could, could I just ask everyone to raise your hands if you've heard of shared capital cooperative between cities? Okay. Some people do. Yeah. How about capital impact partners? Okay. So moving on to investing in communities that banks fail to serve. Um, I think, am I leading on this one? Yep. Or, yeah. Um, so one of, a lot of the self-help federal credit unions work. Annie McShearis is my, is my colleague who works in Oakland, California. Um, anyone here in California, Florida, or Chicago? We got one, we got two. Okay, maybe we'd love to connect because we are in those states. But essentially, self -help, one of self-help's work, and we were hoping when the executive order was to roll out a national platform so that we would have tablets and lending ability and to train folks in various partner sites across our network to say, hey, we can do DAPA DACA, Deferred Action Citizen you know, Loans. We can do citizenship loans. Would you say any? Yeah, there is no DACA. DACA. Anymore? DACA. I know. Well, it originally... Can you just define and do like a jargon check? So yeah. DACA is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. This is the policy that President Obama enacted um, about two and a half years ago that allowed young people, young people who were brought to this country um, without documentation to apply for this deferred action mm -hmm. status. And what it is, it's a two-year status that they can renew. It protects them from deportation, gives them a work permit, access to a social security number, and really opens the door to a lot of opportunities for people that they wouldn't otherwise have. He tried to expand it to a broader pool of people, including some of those parents of DACA recipients. And this is what just got um, brought to the Supreme Court. There was a tie, so it's still frozen. But there's still quite a few people, millions, that are eligible for DACA. 
um, and will and need help paying the application fees because it's close to five hundred dollars every time you, you when you apply and then to renew it. And so it's an impediment for a lot of people, especially if there's multiple you know, children that are eligible in one family. So self-help, um, my organization with two credit unions in the city, many others around the country have launched loan funds to provide those small dollar loans. And the one that we established, New Economy Project with two credit unions, charges no interest. People get an account at a credit at these community development credit unions. We put $25 in for them as an incentive so that when they're done paying off that loan, they have a, a bit of money to start saving long term. They get access to everything the credit union offers. So like, you know, free tax preparation, all the things that they're going to need as they start entering, right, start working and start getting targeted for credit card solicitations and others from predatory actors. They have, you know, they have a base and a relationship with a responsible nonprofit cooperative. Um, and self-help is taking it to another level Which with their work. Little, that's one benefit to scaling up is that you can have replicate a model in all your branch networks. So while we're doing that in California or Chicago, Day and others are doing it in different different states around the country. And th this is a real serious need. Even if DAP and DACA got X'd, yeah. it's still credit building loans. We can still do small dollar loans on a platform and work with partner organizations. So the Mexican consulates are a major network of partnership for us in um, LA, Southern California, and around Chicago. And we're now in, I'll talk about Florida. Um, and some LA new econ ec economics for women, uh, the Youth Policy Institute. I mean, th th again, these are ways, these are community groups that can partner with, with these CDFIs, loan fund or credit union, to possibly meet the needs of those in your community. Yeah, just to be clear, in the New York example, it was a nonprofit, my nonprofit, that went to these credit unions and said, we want to develop this program and create new special terms, 0% interest and all of these things. They sat at the table with us and crafted a new policy. They got approved by the board. So like, this is just one example. There might be other needs yeah. in your neighborhood, in your communities that you could similarly do that right. with. Um, and just to be totally clear, because immigrant communities are, you know, their needs are beyond just DACA application mm -hmm. fees, right? And so our institution, which is in New York City, which is, you know, 40, close to 40% immigrant, we've made sure, and a lot of the community development credit unions around New York and beyond have also increasingly done this. Everything that we offer is available to people regardless of immigration status. We've made mortgage loans to people who are undocumented. We provide yeah. everything that we would offer to a U.S. citizen that to all of the people in our neighborhood. We don't discriminate and only serve uh, people with that have green cards and legal status. You know, we're really about serving everyone in our community and that is perfectly legal, yeah. perfectly permissible under every single banking law, right. but do most it. of the big banks <laughs> don't do it. So we do more, we, a lot of self-help, bread and butter when you say it, actually is um, uh, good ethical auto loans. Like $38 million in auto loans across California or uh, like last year. It's, and then also mortgages, to undocumented folks and mortgages. People, you know, so just these are the products that credit unions are lending in communities. Um, Rocio Jimenez is a borrower on our website. There's a video profile, and I just wanted to put her face up there as a, um, a Dreamer recipient. If you wanted to go to our website, we have, we have some materials, mm -hmm. but we're going to keep on moving. Yeah. And then fostering communities with color ownership. I guess this is, um, okay, so this is to my starting this? Yeah. yeah, because, okay, so self help now being the largest CDFI, we have a very large net worth. We have over 550 employees across the country. This is distinct from credit union, most credit unions. But what, what's happened is we've taken the preservation of actually preserving these, remember what I said about all the credit unions that were failing and that, that a lot of our minority owned credit unions have not been able to survive. Well, we've been actually merging with them. And one of them was in Southwest Chicago, a savings and loan. When you talk about savings and loan, you think about 19, that movie, right? The, the original savings and loan that was supposed to just do savings and lending. So that was a savings and loan. They were needed to fold. They, they couldn't survive. This is, the, this is what's been happening, unfortunately, with all of what we named going to the 40s and 70s. They were gonna, what happens when you fail? People know the process. If you have mortgages, or loans on your books, you're, they're going to be they're going to be they're going to be auctioned off to the low, the highest bidder at a very low cost. So this is what happens when banks fail. So what happens to those? If this is Southwest Chicago, mostly Mexican immigrant families, what's going to happen to their loans if that bank fails? Who you tell me? And what will happen to those loans? What will happen to those families that once had a mortgage? 
the interest will soar. And will they be able to stay in their home? Probably not. So we figured out how to buy, work with whoever we needed to, to save that save, preserve that institution, convert them to a credit union. There was 1,100 mortgages that were 30% of those mortgage portfolio was 60 days delinquent. We, we worked with those families and worked to, to modify those loans. Most of those families were able to stay in their homes and we are still serving those families in Southwest Chicago. But who would be able to come and do that? So it's part of our social justice history, even though we are a scaled up institution. But this is part of our founders said, hey, wait, we need to preserve credit unions too. That just happened in Florida. Faith-based credit union, we're moving into Florida. But the real reason we're moving into Florida is to fight the predatory lending. You bring your practice and you bring your policy work together. So if we come in and we can like say that we can work with a credit union, we can build out in Miami and different markets where there's lots of need, and we can start taking on the big boys in the, the, in the General Assembly. So I, that's an aspect. It's a different type of aspect, but it is what really has motivated our, my institution's sort of work in this space. And that story makes me cry. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the need, it's because unfortunate. Because it's so important. It's so important that it wasn't bought up and became predatory, that, that families' homes were preserved as their home. Thanks, Melissa. It's so a little bit of a different ways we can talk, think about partnership, right? Did we miss anything? We just, I mean, we have, we're doing work with food co-ops, with our Renaissance Community Co-op in the room, Marnie from Greensboro, we're as a developer, but we're, I'm not talking about what CDFIs do as community development agencies or building housing, but they do. Uh, hug, come over here, come over here. Yes, we're gonna move up. To your clients, do you usually then sell those mortgages to spread into any on the secondary market, or do you hold them? Under we hold them. You hold them. We do have a program. We can talk yes. about it, the secondary market, but. Um, <laughs> no, most credit unions still do. It's really it's old-fashioned kind of lending, you know, and we keep it on our books. A lot of credit unions, even if we had the ability to sell them off, we wouldn't because we feel like we want to make sure that our members are being properly communicated with. We don't want to have someone else be in touch with them and expose them to possibly, you know, abusive collection tactics and things like that. Um, but it does, it poses challenges with the books, you know, the sort of balance sheets of credit unions sometimes, and it, it, it means we have to find creative ways no, to continue to make right. loans. I was asking because I was wondering if you did any advocacy around what's happening to credit and banking. Like, that whole secondary well, market, which is let's talk. That's positive. loaded. Yeah, that's there you. Out there, yeah. Instead of selling to Fannie or Freddie, credit unions and CDFIs can join the Federal Home Loan Bank in their region, and they can use the housing assets, keep them, and leverage those to get cheap capital from the Federal Home Loan Bank system. We're There's also, you know, and all, then of the our federation. Credit, all of our credit unions <laughs> are members of a national federation <laughs> of CDCUs, and they have a secondary market to help member credit unions also um, have a way to, to get some of the loans off their books so they can make more mm -hmm. loans. Um, but there's lots of resources like that. So, you know, if people are really interested in the, in the weeds of it all, we love to talk about that too, so we could do that after. And we're gonna, we're gonna get, we're gonna, Dave's okay. gonna move us right now. Yeah. All right, what do you have, what, 15 minutes? Yeah, that's a little yeah, that's fast. Really slow. Yeah, that's you're a little right, 15 fast. minutes. Okay. All right, so we are gonna, um, are people up for breakout groups? Yeah. Yes. yeah? Okay. Yes. So we're going to do um, about 10 minutes of breakout group discussion. And these are just sort of guiding questions or areas that can guide your conversation or not. Talk about whatever you want. But we thought, you know, what are some opportunities to collaborate in your communities? What are ideas or examples that you all want to share with everyone else in the room to think about? Um, and then there's just questions around values. Are these institutions the right ones to drive the new economy? Are there principles we can, you know, pull from that? And what are the shortcomings and limitations? We're not saying this is a one-size-fits-all or perfect solution, but um, you know, you guys can discuss that and all and lots more. Do you have a question? Yeah, I, sort of a general question, but um, a lot of what you've talked about is very U.S. focused um, yep. for U.S. organizations that work in other places. So, like, I, I mean, obviously, like other countries have different finance systems, but and for U.S. organizations right. that work in other places, are you? able to provide services outside of the U.S. or our institutions know and equivalents around the country. We can talk if you want. 
There's a World Council of Credit Unions to talk, check in with. They're often called like savings associations. They have different Rose names. You know, right? Yeah, right. We don't. All right, so how should we, should we count off or just grab in your groups? You wanna count off and mix it up? Sure. Yes. Okay, let's start here. One, two, three. One, two, three, yes, up to three only. Yeah. <laughs> three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One. Two. Back there. One. Two. Three. 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 One. Two